So good. So um, we're going to sit here. Just we're hoping to really have a conversation with everyone. So it's a, a it's an intimate enough room and not too many, like not not overflowing. So we're really hoping to have a conversation. Um, and to start that off, um, we're going to just have the panelists, these very impressive panelists, um, talk talk for a bit and then open it up. So I um, just wanted to uh, describe the goals or just some of the conversations we've had around this panel. So the pan panel, as you know, is called Achieving Excellence Through Effective Governance. And what is that, right? Um, so governance um, in general um, is not the, not, I know not the most interesting uh, aspects in terms of the operations of, the, of an organization, but we really think, um, as everyone here probably agrees, it's a critical part of, a, of, of having an effective organization. And then just thinking about the times that we are in, currently about the last couple of weeks in particular, and just what we've dealt with the last couple of years of COVID, um, just uh, significant movements, the Me Too movement, as well as Black Lives Matter. Like, we're always on the, the, the front lines as these nonprofits, and really how do we deal with all of those matters while still running our organization effectively? Right, that's often a challenge. So we're hoping to address some, not, probably not all, the issues, but really um, addressing it in a way that hopefully will be helpful to you. So that's, with that being said, um, I wanted to just um, also just have a, we want to make sure to understand the audience if possible. So just wondering, um, uh, I know this, we did this in a prior panel, but curious in terms of this crowd here, um, how many are here are involved in nonprofit organizations that can be identified as older organizations, maybe more than five years? Even older than that, wow. Okay, more than 10 years? Okay, maybe I should put it up a little bit. <laughs> a bit um, higher. <laughs> um, more than 25 years. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. Okay, right, good. More than 100? Oh. These are legacy organizations. Legacy organizations. Oh, those, okay, good. So we have a, a good range here. Um, and how about startups? How many are here um, brand new organizations of one year? Oh, good. Wow. Great. Okay. Um, and are there, um, are there people here who are founders of organizations? Oh, great. And then, um, and then the last question, and then we'll get started. Um, how many people are board members of, of nonprofits? And, and this is the last question. How many people are staff members of nonprofits? Okay. Okay, right, good. No, this is wonderful. So um, this is, um, so everyone here has a different perspective based on your experiences, and we're hoping to really, um, like, and we're hoping to hear from you, so we're hoping to learn from one another. So. Um, the thought is that I wanted, if everyone has had an opportunity to read some of the panelists' background, but I really did want to start us off and just do a short introduction of each panelist before they present. Um, because we, we, my favorite part of, this co of preparing for this was having conversations with these guys. So I'm hoping that you also have that same um, opportunity. Me. Yeah. So we're going to start this conversation with Marcy. Um, Marcy is, um, is a, has a wonderful background. She's, she's, she's a coach, an educator, and a facilitator that is really focused on mission-driven organizations. She's worked, she's worked with boards of trustees and senior staff and really focused on leadership development for those entities or those groups. Um, she's had roles with, as a senior advisor at the Leona uh, and, and Harry B. Helmsley Char Charitable Trust. And she's also served on various boards, including, there's a list, <laughs> but uh, she served as an advisory committee chair of Ask Big Questions and as secretary and governance committee chair of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, amongst many. Um, she, con she currently contributes as a board member at Temple Israel in Westport, Connecticut, and chairs uh, Fairfield County's Chairman's Foundation's Consul Consultants Networks. So Marcy has this really large range, and she's been able, able to really advise various organizations. And then, so we're really pleased to have her here with us. Um, and then we're hoping that maybe we could have a discussion about where governance has, how governance has changed throughout the years. Really talk first about the historical landscape. I know that sounds boring, but it won't be. Um, it's, um, but of uh, governance, because it's really helpful to know what we've, how we've evolved, especially to deal with our current times. So Marcy, if you could start well, us thank off. Thank you, thank you, Astrid. And I'm delighted to be here today. I, I um, early on, 
knew Ken and uh, remember the founding of Vienna. Uh, and I've, uh, I was involved more early on, but I don't live in New York, so it was always hard for me to participate as much. But I've been so delighted to see how the organization has evolved and all, you know, to Ken and Lou back there. Uh, there's been, um, it, it's been tremendous to see what this has meant to Yale and Yale students. Um, I, I appreciated Astrid's introduction uh, about what I do now. I'm a consultant to a wide variety of nonprofit organizations. I've been doing this for more than 15 years now. But I'm going to give you a little bit about my background because it informs why I do governance and why I am a governance geek. I mean, a lot of people find it boring or uninteresting. I have found it from the beginning absolutely fascinating. I am a Yale PhD. I came to New Haven in 1980. I'm old, so that's another <laughs> thing you need to know because I'm going to give you a generational sensibility of how governance has changed. Um, I came to Yale to do my doctorate and to be an academic and to teach. My field is Spanish and Latin American literature. I did that. I taught at Wesleyan. And I was asked back to Yale to work in what was then called the Office of the Secretary under Benno Schmidt's administration. Sheila Wellington was the secretary of the university. So the very first board of trustees I ever worked with was the Yale Corporation. I mean, talk about starting at the sublime. <laughs> and then through the years, I've hit bottom with the ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> boards of trustees are all over the place, right? So my introduction to governance was the Yale Corporation, and I was mesmerized by this. Um, I staffed it, and so, you know, there, this was before electronic mail. I mean, the board books we had to put together regularly and the timing to get these massive volumes out to them exactly two weeks before each board meeting. I mean, it was very rigorous. So I was trained up in a sense of rigor around governance. I was in that office for six years, and among other things that I did, all those blue light telephones, hello. I was the security guru on campus during that time. And I was involved with putting together the women's table, Maya Lin's women's table. I worked, I worked broadly across the university. It was, it was a marvelous experience. And what I learned uh, that has been valuable in my own nonprofit work is I was a specialist in my academic field, but I was a generalist when it came to all of this nonprofit work. I was recruited away from the secretary's office to build, as the first founding executive director, to build the Center for Jewish Life, Slifka Center, which some of you may know. And that was going to the ridiculous from the sublime, because we had a board of trustees that really didn't understand its role. And because Slifka Center conceived of itself as entirely a Jewish organization, it didn't have a nonprofit sensibility. So I had to bring nonprofit knowledge to this because we were a 501c3 independent of the Yale campus, and there were there were structures that just did, weren't present that we needed to build. I learned nonprofit on that job. There was a great um, program on campus called PONPO, the Program on Nonprofit Organizations, at that time run by a guy named Peter Dobkin Hall. And I would go to these weekly seminars and learn all about the nonprofit sector. So we are talking now mid-90s. From Slifka Center, I was recruited away to a $100 million family foundation. I was the first professional that they had leading the foundation. So then I was working with a family foundation board. I did that for 10 years. And um, as a result of that work and serving on other boards, I trained to become a mediator because the dynamics on the boards were such. <laughs> I never planned to hang out a shingle to be a mediator, but I really wanted to learn the facilitative techniques that you needed in order to make boards work well together. So there's, you know, there's theory and practice in board work. There's great theory. And as a consultant, my job is to read all of that theory and turn it into practice for my clients. 
it's highly interpersonal work. It's building, you know, a team spirit and a team mentality within legal and ethical and uh, thought mode frameworks. But, and there's a real process to board work, but most people don't know it. And especially on family foundation boards, there's a lot of family dynamic uh, that gets in the way. There's a lot of dysfunction. So I have all these great um, mediation skills that I bring to my board work. From, from the Dibner Fund, which was this fabulous family foundation, I served as um, an internal advisor to the Helmsley Trust, which is a mega foundation. And I worked directly with one of, there were four trustees at that time uh, early on in the development of the foundation. Uh, now there are only three. So that was a very other kind of foundation board. And I've, and I've served on a lot of boards. So what, why am I telling you all this background? I continue to be fascinated by boards. I have been reading board theory ever since um, I realized as an executive director of Slifka Center, I had to find some you know, intellectual framework. I'm a trained scholar. This is what I do. You know, I'm going to read and, and learn. And um, for those of you who are in these older organizations, more than 10 or 25, or we saw over 100 year old legacy organizations, what I'm going to describe is that the culture of governance on nonprofit boards has changed enormously in, in the time that I've been doing this. And, uh, you know, we actually have a timeline. I've, I was trained by BoardSource as a governance consultant, and BoardSource put together early on this great timeline of critical moments in the evolution of, of nonprofit board development. And it included a lot of books, a lot of articles from Harvard Business Review, um, eventually articles from SSIR, the Sanford Social Innovation Review. And I would say that the shift sped up a great deal uh, in the mid-2000s, the 20-teens, and then especially in um, the last five years, you know, starting with um, COVID, pre-COVID, and the, the racial reckoning that happened during COVID. So where the shift started, it was in about 1990 when the... Um, management guru Peter Drucker started writing about managing the nonprofit organization. So the idea that someone, you know, with the prestige of Peter Drucker would turn his, attemp his attention from corporate America to nonprofit America was signaled that there was something there to start looking at. We can go year by year, decade by decade, and see that all of the theory about nonprofit governance work started shifting, including at Yale. Um, uh, Jeff Sonnenfeld wrote what makes, a what makes Boards Great, you know, Jeff Sonnenfeld from SOM. Uh, that was in 2002. Uh, in 2003, the Stanford Social Innovation Review started being published. In 2005, one of the biggest um, shifts in the theory of nonprofit governance came around called Governance as Leadership, which was a, a book that reframed the work of nonprofit boards by actively looking at what it, are the leadership skills, what are the leadership behaviors, what are the leadership modes of thought that we need to actually lead. We're not managing these organizations. We're leading. And the difference between leadership and management is critical on a nonprofit board. Uh, the same year, 2005, Jim Collins, who had written Good to Great, wrote a monograph for nonprofits, Good to Great for the social sectors, right? And then, you know, it kept going on like this, that, that um, great thinking in nonprofit governance leadership started building as a field, as a theoretical field, and uh, intersecting with those changes in the theory 
were a lot of societal changes. I mean, we had scandals in the 90s. Uh, we had the Adelphi University scandal, the United Way scandal, eventually the Enron scandal. <laughs> things that led to the government uh, and the IRS starting to look more closely at how nonprofits functioned. So the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, although nonprofits are not um, legislated by that act, we started incorporating things like audit committees and whistleblower policies. We would take the best practices. We're a self-governing sector. We don't have a board of standards, but we would create best practices based on what was happening out in the world. Uh, in 2007, the IRS started uh, including specific questions about governance on the 990 tax filing as a way of flagging to boards of trustees, hey, you have a real fiduciary responsibility here and we're, we're watching you. We are watching you. So it all started changing and then it started shifting very quickly through the Me Too movement, the Black Lives movement, and then the watershed movement of uh, this younger generation looking at Me Too, looking at black lives, looking at you know, the racial reckoning that, that culminated, you know, wasn't the only terrible death, but culminated in the George Floyd murder. This demand for greater equity, greater transparency on boards, greater parity on boards, um, shifted again in the theory space and in 2021, Ann Wallestead, who was then the CEO of BoardSource, which is our go-to place for um, the gathering place for all of this great knowledge in theory and practice, Ann Wallestead published an article that, that was really quite um, earth-shattering for boards, and it was called Purpose Driven Board Leadership. And if anything shifted in the DEI space, and this is a sort of came out of looking at how diversity, equity, and inclusion affected the work of nonprofit boards, all of a sudden, all of the, the, the old fashioned concept of the board sitting up here on top of the organization, well, we started shattering that and we started moving the board sort of in a more lateral place on the org chart in a direct line of partnership with the CEO. But the problem is boards were being very solipsistic thinking about their own organizations. When they were taking their fiduciary obligations very, very seriously, they were always very concerned about that duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of obedience, but incredibly that duty of loyalty to only our organization. What Ann Wallestead's article blew up was saying to organizations, that's just simply not enough anymore. You know, in purpose-driven leadership, yeah, you have to think about your organization, but what about the desired social outcome we're, we're seeking here? You know, she set up these four lenses, okay? So one lens was purpose before organization. A traditional board might ask the question, what's best for our organization? And only think very internally about the organization. But a purpose-driven organization might ask, what's best for the desired social outcome we seek? And all of a sudden, the, the view shed is a little bit outside because we're supposed to be effective. We're supposed to be achieving outcomes. We are a socially based organization. So it's not just enough to make sure our ducks are in a row, but we, we have a bigger issue here. The second lens with, that relates to this was respect for the ego, ecosystem. So no nonprofit is an island unto itself. A traditional board might ask a question, how will this impact our organization, right? But an ecosystem aware board might say, how would this impact all of the players and dynamics within our ecosystem? Will it help us as an entire ecosystem do the most good? Now, this was a huge paradigm shift because, you know, boards, 
really didn't think much outside of their boardrooms. They didn't think about peer organizations. They didn't think about ecosystem. They weren't putting it in this context. The third lens is an equity mindset. You know, we have to advance equitable outcomes. So a traditional board might ask, how will our strategy advance our mission? Thinking only about ourselves. A purpose-driven board will say, how will this decision or strategy create more equitable outcomes? So all of a sudden, that's part of the conversation in the boardroom. It's not just about our own individual success, but aren't we driven toward equity in the entire ecosystem? Aren't we, aren't we here by the privilege of society, and aren't we supposed to be doing more outside of this room? And then the last lens has to do with authorized voice and power. A traditional board would ask, who do we think uh, is, is best to serve on our board? Who do we think? You know, who's in your network? Who's in my network? You know, who has the money? Who doesn't? Um, but a purpose-driven board looks at it differently and is going to ask, is our board populated in a way that ensures that our power is authorized by and inclusive of the community impacted by the work we do? Now, that's an earth-shattering change. You know, we're now seeing that more boards are looking to, beyond just the diversity, equity, and inclusion, the belonging, the justice piece of that, that the stakeholders, the people served by the organization have to have a voice in what the organization is doing. And if those people can't speak for themselves, then their families have to speak for them, or people closely connected with their well-being have to speak for them. And it can't always be just a, a you know, a, nomination from a money-driven perspective. Sometimes these folks can't afford the kinds of gives or gets that the boards require. But the true equity and the true authorized voice and power come from those voices on our boards. So there's been this huge shift generally, generationally in boards. And what I have seen in my work, and I'm going to end here to let my colleagues speak, is that the older organizations haven't moved along necessarily in this shift. And they're very confused. And the real challenge is that boards are meant to do good work. And people get on boards with the intention of doing good work. But shockingly, they are never trained. And this has been my mission. I train boards of trustees. And I train boards of trustees in a behavioral way. Yes, you need to know your legal obligations. Yes, you need to know your ethical obligations. But do you know how to communicate? Do you know how to think as a board member? Do you know how to process decision making together as a group? You're a team. You're a super brain. How do we work together? This is, you know, um, full body contact, high touch sport, and we're a team. And if there's anything that I would like to leave you with today is not that the governance of nonprofits is broken, as many people will say. The governance of nonprofits is untrained. And what we need to do is educate our boards and train them and give them the tools they need to do the excellent work that they're intending to do. Um, and give them the context they need to understand what their role is separate from managing. Because most of the people who come onto the board, they come to the board meeting at the end of a work day where they've been managing all day. <laughs> and then they're expected to shift into this governance mode. And how do they do that? So we need to help them. And that's what I do. Thank, thank you, Marcy. No. Um, and thank you. I, I think um, we, we wanted to start off with that discussion just to, again, frame the issues. Um, because as we, um, the discussion that we're having about leading organizations, especially as a board for governance matters, um, it really does take um, a different perspective sometimes for some of these issues that do come up. But 
we're also dealing with operational issues, right? right? right. So especially for the, the smaller organizations, sometimes we have these large ideas, um, but just in terms of our current operations, it's hard to implement. So we're going to talk about some of those challenges as well. So our next uh, panelist is Cindy Lott. Um, she's currently a clinical professor of philanthropic studies um, and the director of the professional doctorate in, in the, at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. Um, she, um, prior to joining the school, and this is how I have, a, um, I ha how we met, uh, she was associate professor of professional practice and academic director for nonprofit management programs, um, that she led this large program of uh, practitioners and really helped us develop a way to, um, to educate um, upcoming uh, uh, management and leaders in nonprofits in both the practical and theoretical and tools. And she's also a wonderful mentor. Um, um, full disclosure, I, I used to work, I, I still work there and based on uh, Cindy's, uh, uh, just based in large part for, uh, for Cindy's um, knowledge and experience and, um, and we miss her dearly. Um, so currently, but her, her pra practice and study has often been in these areas that we're discussing, in, in particular, particular, she has an emphasis on ethics. Um, she uh, served as a non-resident fellow at the Center of Nonprofits and Philanthropy at the Urban Institute, and she's also a 1993 graduate of the Yale Law School. So um, I want you to welcome uh, Cindy and have her lead us in some of our discussions about one of the pillars that you talked about and other things about equity, ethics, et cetera. So. Welcome. Thank you so much, Astrid. I really, really appreciate it. It's wonderful to be here. This is my first time at Yana. Um, I'm a convert, so it's all good. Um, I know that we're off to a rollicking start when we have to uh, say things like, I know you think this is going to be boring, but... <laughs> so, um, you know, I used to teach governance at, at that unnamed university, at Columbia University, um, where Astrid and I met. I would teach governance. I, would, I designed the program and govern, our governance class and designed our ethics class and it was always kind of a hard sell with students and I'd say it's really the backbone of virtually everything that we do. So I really appreciated Marcy's comments. There are most everything she said I agree with save one little thing that I will make a point of um, simply because it's my own perspective and, and the work that I've been doing for a long time. Um, you know if I say governance you say amorphous. Um, that's the answer to this. Part of the reason for this and why I would suggest to you that governance is not boring, just as no, Marcy said, um, is that it's all of the things. And everybody brings a very different perspective to governance. And I will say this also, uh, similar to Marcy, based on my own background, as Astrid mentioned. So I'm a, a trained lawyer, and I've been a general counsel of nonprofit, a political, twice over, political nonprofits. I've helped start many nonprofits. I've helped many legacy nonprofits. I've worked on the philanthropy side. I've worked on the nonprofit side. I'm now in education. I'm an academic. I do, my research is regulatory policy, which is probably the part where I might slightly disagree with something Marcy mentioned to be, to be discussed in just a second. Um, and so what it means is that I have seen governance and just kind of the sector from all these different perspectives, and I would suggest that that is embedded in this room and in the entirety of Yana as well. That means we need a shared language, which is really hard when you come from all these different perspectives. It's incredibly buoying because it means that you all have so many different experiences to bring to the table, but not having a shared lexicon can be difficult. And it's kind of a drag in um, not just board meetings, but in talking to employees, et cetera. So blue sky with me for a moment here, because what I think is so interesting about governance is that, as I said, it's the whole kit and caboodle. It's all of the things that go on in an organization. It is not just about the board. It is not just about the board. <laughs> it is the entire organization and the way that people think about your organization. One reason why governance is so amorphous to so many people is that, so the piece that I will mention again here is, so if, if you're an academic looking at governance, you look at it one way. I've done that. If you're a practitioner, you look at governance another way. Done that. And then if you're actually you know, working in the space and you're trying to figure out, as a regulator, what is it that we're gonna be looking at, which are the group I work with all the time, folks that actually do view governance as part of the regulatory scheme, work, uh, scheme in this uh, sector, they look at it very differently as well. So as practitioners, you think about board books. 
You think about making sure you follow the rules, that you get the votes where you need them, that you record them, that you have minutes, that you do all of the things that you're supposed to be doing, right? If you're an academic, you look at governance and say it is a reflection. So practitioners view it as a vehicle to something. Acad academics look at it and say it's a reflection of the functionality or the dysfunction of your organization. And it's really only that much interesting for a lot of academics to study the dysfunction. You know, every organization is like a family. Totally agree with that. You're a therapist. When you enter into the space of dealing with governance, often <laughs> you hear all the things. Okay. Um, and so academics look at it as an organizational behavior reflection, right? Of what is going on inside the organization. I have worked for a very, very long time with state charities regulators. And they are actually the people that do regulate this sector, actually more than the IRS. I've done both. I am here to tell you it's mostly the states. And a big part of what they look at actually is governance. And they are looking at governance to see how things go as an indicator of your intentionality. They look at governance not to say it's good or bad, and you're right, there are no like complete rules of the road here, but there are some. And different states kind of give different indicators. What they're looking at is to see were you, if things are going to go wrong in organizations. There are going to be lots and lots of things that go wrong. You all know that already. What a regulator would look at is to say, was this, and this runs the gamut, was it mere negligence? Did it rise to recklessness? Was it, God forbid, intentional, right? That is what they're looking at. And this is what I'm here to tell you. Governance, the one thing that all three of those groups could agree on, practitioners, academics, and regulators, is that governance is process driven. If you are intentional in the way that you think about governance and you do the things and you're inclusive in your organization and you try to actually hear different perspectives, you do view yourself as a purpose-driven organization, you're thinking of your organization as but one player, in an entire ecosystem, per Marcy's comment, if you do those things and something goes wrong at the end of the day, really, it's quite protective of the organization. Very few people will actually fault you, and regulators definitely won't. <laughs> the problem comes when you're not intentional within your organization, that it's willy-nilly. Now, when the, when the outcome looks great, then maybe nobody looks at it, but you might have had terrible governance behind the scenes, right? It's just that nobody noticed. But eventually they will notice. And that is the part where I suggest to you that governance is a holistic endeavor, it's process driven, and there are ways to actually embed these practices in your organization. I know that Justin's is gonna be talking about some of those too. So, Part of what I think a lot about in governance, um, and to Astra's comment earlier, I think a lot about is ethics. So two of the things that I come to this are not popular things to talk about because everybody wants to say in our sector that we already know this. Governance, good governance, and ethics. That by virtue of sitting in this room and being in the sector, you already know these things somehow by osmosis. Couldn't agree with Marcy Moore. Why we don't train people in this is beyond me. And when people come from a corporate environment and try to translate that, if you will, into, the, into our sector, a chunk of it translates, but not all of it. <laughs> and there are things that you actually need to know in addition, right, in our particular sector. So how does that get us into ethics? So I'm actually writing a book right now on ethics in the nonprofit sector, and I, I also consult in this space in governance and ethics. And the way I talk about it to folks is to say this. So as a lawyer, I'm thrilled when you have legal compliance going on in your organization. That's just baseline. It's easy, there are rules to the road, there are outside experts, we call them attorneys, you can pay them, they will help you, all the things, right? Legal <laughs> compliance is the least of my issues. It's probably the thing that you all worry about the most. It's the thing I worry about the least because I know that there are rules for it. The next layer is best practices. And we do a lot of reliance on best practices in our sector, right? We have them all through board source. We have them through independent sector. All of these great groups, council foundations, you know, all of the different groups that really want to talk about those things. And I applaud all of it with a caveat. Best practices also comes with the 
the understanding that it is also a safe harbor. Not unlike in the corporate environment, that if you do the things that everybody else is doing, you're good. Why would you not do the, the things, right? They, it all looked fine, and if you do it like they do it, that seems right. It's also the way, though, that we replicate really serious inequities. And if you sat through the previous session on um, investment and social impact investment, we want you to actually take risks. We want you to do things that are new and that are difficult and that are unproven. And the way to show that you can take those risks but be intentional is to do sometimes more than just best practices. And that's where you get to ethics. Because ethics sits above all of those things. And if you can show that you are doing, yes, legal compliance, and you've taken a look at best practices and you've intentionally decided, yeah, I think we should follow this on that because that seems to have worked, but we really feel we want to do something new here. And again, replicating what has considered best practices historically, and our sector is not immune from this, has really produced some serious inequities and lack of inclusion in our sector. And so thinking about how to move beyond best practices into an ethical environment, now you've got governance. All of those levels leads to governance. And talking to your um, staff and frankly to your volunteers, reflecting this in your communications, in either your annual reports or in your fundraising, on your websites, like all the things that you know to do, Think about how to integrate, not just that we're legally compliant, here's our 990, and not just that we follow best practices because we know what they are and we're aware of our peers, but we actually go above and beyond that because we think ethically, what is our role in this larger ecosystem that Marcy indicated? How is it that we have come to be as a mission-driven organization and we set ourselves apart from other organizations that that is not the bottom line, if you will, right? Taken together, holistically, now we have a governance framework. And that's why I find it always so interesting and fascinating is to keep adding into these layers. And it's, it's little bit, you know, it, it's, the, it's the levels and really sophisticated organizations get there eventually. And it's cyclical, it's not linear. You will find as you bring on new board members and you have good governance committees that actually keep you accountable and you integrate ethics and governance into your board meetings, put it on the agenda. Every board meeting. Allow this to, to become part you know, and permeate your meetings, part of your retreats, part of your recruitment for your board members. Talk openly and normalize these ideas I think you will find it's um, amazing how much conversation can be generated around these topics instead of like, oh yes, and then we're gonna deal with governance mm -hmm. out here. It's not, it's everything you do and all of the mission that you bring and the passion that you bring to that mission. So I'm happy to answer any questions later. I could talk with all of you and get your experiences and I would love that as a researcher. Um, but thank you again for having me. Look forward to Justin's comments yeah. too. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Marcy. I think that's a good framework for us because I think a lot of, um, I think both of you talked about the changes and about being intentional, mm -hmm. right? If, if especially we, we have certain aspirational goals. How do we get there? And it really is something that we have to, to make sure that we all agree to do in the organization and we actually implement in some ways. Um, and I just know in practice, um, I serve as a general counsel of a nonprofit and we talk about our board meetings. Um, we often talk about these things, uh, but it's hard to actually dedicate time even if it's on the agenda uh, because of several operational issues mm -hmm. that Justin's going to speak about as well. So really thinking about ways to do the uh, to balance the both of them is really um, some of the conversation I hope we have a little bit later. So, um, but Justin, I wanted to introduce Justin. Justin's currently a counsel at the tax ex in the tax exempt organizations department of Patterson, Belknap, Webb, and Tyler, where he represents a wide range of public charities and private foundations. And he is such a resource. Um, I think he, like, well, he's, he, I think he give informal 
uh, conversations, it's really nice, but you're also um, such a resource to have many, a variety of clients. He, his clients include universities, museums, uh, artists endowed and family foundations, donor advised funds, human rights organizations, business leagues, social clubs, and other tax exempt entities. And I'm sure uh, your, your um, clients also have the range of the years of experience that we have here. Um, he, has, um, he also has some experience of helping organizations to develop international subsidiaries and international grant making programs programs and managing governance crises. So he has both this domestic experience and the international experience. And he's also a Yale grad, uh, undergrad, a doctorate in political science, and a JD from Yale. So we have a triple Yale here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Justin, Justin's again is going to talk about some of the operational issues um, that uh, I know we're going to learn a lot from. So thank you, Justin. Great. Thanks, Astrid. And thank both of you for, for your comments. I have many things that I actually want to argue with you on a few <laughs> points, but I won't bring them all up now. But I want to start start with a basic premise, which is, and I'm sorry to share this, this is a horrible time to serve on boards of nonprofit organizations. I'm just going to start off with why that is. Um, and, and let's be very clear, there are amazing organizations that are doing more and more than we've ever dreamt possible. The spectrum of what nonprofits can do has expanded dramatically, not just in the last few decades, but even in the last five years, I would say. Um, the world is filled with crises, and nonprofits are uniquely positioned to solve crises. But here's the thing. Not necessarily by design, because nothing legal is actually by design in a common law universe. Everything kind of happens through happenstance. But we have a model in the United States where we have private associations that are receiving tax-deductible money and state funding, federal funding. Um, and they don't pay taxes on that money because they are doing things for the public. So there's this distinction drawn, which is we have a system where our nonprofits are meant to be corporations or trusts, but they're governed by a small group of usually volunteers. In recent years, the demand for accountability by those volunteers has expanded dramatically Sometimes in ways that we can talk about are meant to further equity, that are meant to make sure, particularly from a state regulatory perspective, that donor funds are being used in the way that they're meant to be used. But often their accountability is demanded in a, in a, in a way that reveals a kind of new range of stakeholders that sometimes want better things to be done, however that's defined, and sometimes are out for blood. And I think if you, if you think about social media in this context, social media has made me extremely busy as a lawyer who specializes in governance crises at nonprofits and has made it incredibly difficult to recruit board members to serve on organizations both young and old because the exposure risk is simply so great. And this can happen in a number of different ways. A donation is received by somebody who turns out to be Harvey Weinstein. Um, you discover that you have a lot of Sackler money that has come in. Uh, staff members are upset about a decision being made by management. There's a union dispute. And whereas it used to be the case that board members had to be aware of these issues, they had to respond to these issues, they weren't expected to respond in real time, again, usually as volunteers, to a barrage of attacks that are coming, not just by media outlets that we might all recognize as, you always know that the New York Times is going to sniff around and find a story if there's a story at an institution. But now you have this expectation that because somebody posts something on Instagram, somebody posts something on whatever we're supposed to call Twitter these days, um, the board needs to step in on behalf of the organization. Because if management is not responding properly, it's on the board to do so. Or if the board is doing something, management is suddenly in the awkward position of trying to figure out, how do I deal with a difficult or problematic board member? So you know, Marcy, you, you had started with the fact that you know, we often start with the kind of the duties of care, loyalty, and obedience in New York. And there is something kind of wonderfully genteel and quaint about the legal duties, because they don't actually give a lot of guidance. We have this principle under American law that you will act prudently as a board member. And if you do that, your decisions won't be questioned by the state regulators. But it's actually very challenging for people, particularly people coming from a for-profit context where bankers are around, consultants are around to sort of tell you the right decision. And you're measured in terms of what the right decision is based on where the share price goes. For example, if you're on the board of a public company, to suddenly being at a museum or a university 
that's facing an unexpected crisis that in many ways is being inflicted by a public that may be part of the community that's being served by the organization, but has never had a seat at the table, and I would argue never had a seat at the table by design. And this is part of, I think, the real challenge today for governance, and it's where a lot of these crises come from, which is it's, it's all well and good for us to talk about the need for an organization to be accountable, to rethink its mission, but there's a reason that process was meant to be somewhat internal. Does, I don't want to say inward facing, although that sometimes happens, but there has to be a space in which board members and management collectively acting as governance can actually make decisions in a prudent and thoughtful manner without being afraid that they're going to be interrupted by a protest or by personal attacks that are coming in from social media. Now, I, I can't solve that problem, but I will say a couple things that I, that I tell clients on a regular basis when this inevitably happens. The first point is you have to actually think critically and not govern from fear. And the number of board members I see on a regular basis, and CEOs as well, I should be clear, who immediately say, we've got a crisis here because somebody is angry at us. Welcome to nonprofit life. Mm -hmm. People are always going to be angry at you. The question is, are they right? But the next question is, is this worthy of a response directly, or are we going to suddenly get into a kind of cat and mouse game where we're just chasing each other around, and the fights are going to get worse and worse? The second question is, is this an issue that should be solved by management, or is it an issue that actually deserves the board's time? And this is a really hard question, because governance consultants, and I do this all the time too, will often, in the kind of introduction, distinguish between the work of the board and the work of management. Um, but the reality is that's really hard to know sometimes where that line is, and it's really getting harder and harder to know. I've seen situations where you know, a museum director or a university president says, the problem is not me, the problem is the board. I demand the board change itself. Technically, that's actually not how it works. Um, it's not a crazy statement sometimes, but it, it creates really complicated issues. And when should the chairman of an organization be the person issuing a statement if a statement's needed, as opposed to the CEO? So figuring out, is this really a board problem or a management problem, and how do you respond to it? And then I think the third one is, and this is where, Marcy, you and I might disagree a little bit, or I don't think you and I disagree, but I would disagree with some of the recent purpose-driven governance theory, I should say. Okay. I apologize for that. Um, the question of how do you respond if you're making changes, if you're making decisions, there is an argument that says, well, we're an old institution, and by like an old institution, you could be six months old and you'd be the old institution once you're getting the criticism. But we have an obligation to look outward, we have to take criticism seriously wherever it comes from, and therefore we need to react to it and make changes. I would always say, go back to your mission and ask the question, is what is being demanded here, even if it comes from a good place, are we best equipped to respond to those changes? Museums are a great example of this problem. You know, museums are public-facing institutions. They perennially have a problem of getting people into the building to look at artwork. Um, they are also institutions whose purpose is to hold collections for a time period which we don't know what that is. There are going to be moments where the collections of that, that art, art, art goes in waves in terms of the market, the kinds of things that people are interested in. But when you're a museum, you have a collection, ideally, for perpetuity. But when you get complaints about what's being on display, what the exhibitions are, what you have in storage or don't have in storage, those are moments where you have to stop and say, is our job to respond to the criticisms that are arising or to go back to basics and say, what is the role of a museum with respect to its collections? What is the role with respect to the public? And then find something either on one extreme or the other or in between. So I, I raise these, these, these points because I think one of the challenges for this space is that we have enough law that I can stay in business and advise on it. But the, the, the biggest challenge here is that it is becoming somewhat untenable the extent to which board members and management have to respond both to external and internal stakeholders on a regular basis. I don't have a solution to this problem, but I do ask myself on a regular basis, why are people joining boards? Again, they join <laughs> boards because they care about the organization. They join boards because they want the social capital that comes from it. And let's be clear, organizations benefit from that social capital because it brings in money. 
but the reputational risk and the exposure that it brings I think have the potential to really put limitations on the ability to have people be willing to serve in these roles. So it's a larger question that we need to think about that ultimately I think starts at this distinction between the private and the public, and it's one that we're gonna continue to be wrestling with for some time. Okay. Well, thank you, Justin. Um, so I think we could say that uh, Governance is not boring. <laughs> uh, I think that's, uh, we've concluded that. Um, but I think we want to open it up to have a conversation with you because, um, so for the, if there are any questions, um, okay, good. And then we're gonna start that conversation. So let's, let's heat up the atmosphere. Let's heat up the discussion. Would you share your perspectives, uh, perhaps even just over, overviews uh, on what's going on at Penn, University of Pennsylvania right now? Um, uh, I'd be very curious. I see it as a, an incredibly serious governance issue, perhaps as great as any face in any institution of higher education today. I'll jump in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, universities have brought a real problem on themselves in the last few years. And they've done this in a couple ways. The first is that they, they decided that they were going to act as moral institutions. And they regularly describe themselves as acting in moral institutions. Um, and they want to create moral spaces where students find comfort and are able to explore knowledge. But the comfort part of this is always built in. So universities are now in the business of issuing statements on a regular basis and getting it wrong on a regular basis. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to look at the statement from the president of Williams recently, which was a really interesting one, because she said, I will issue statements on issues of academic freedom and on higher education issues. I'm not going to issue a statement on the Israel-Hamas war, because I'm, a, I'm the president of a university. You don't need to hear from me. That's a controversial statement, but it's one worth thinking about. Universities also have a problem, which is that they court donors very actively because they need their money. They, they kind of create a club for the donors. Um, and then, you know, you, you, there's a real challenge in an institution involving, involving academic freedom, which faculty members like to bring up all the time, which is how much influence should donors actually have. Um, I am always very cautious about kind of pointing fingers at a university president because speaking of jobs that are really, really hard to have, mm -hmm. that's probably the hardest one. Um, and I will say, you know, I, I think for those of us in this space for the last couple weeks, I, it's been really a challenge to kind of watch every institution not know how to react mm -hmm. because on one hand, you know, I found myself you know, distraught after watching the attacks in Israel by Hamas, angry, horrified, sad, often in tears, trying to make sense of it and wanting to hear people join me in that emotion. And then also trying to think as somebody who advises institutions, but what is the advice I'm supposed to give to somebody who has to manage so many different stakeholders, many of whom, by the way, have tenure, which makes everything more complicated, mm -hmm. um, as well as students and donors. Um, so I think the pen issue, I'm not going to resolve the pen issue, but I think it reflects a certain extent of what I'm talking about here, which is what is the role of the university is question number one. And you can decide that the role of the university is to be a moral arbiter, to, to, to provide moral education for students. We did that in the United States for about 150, 200 years. You could decide that universities are more Germanic in their approach, and it's about research and the, the debate that goes on in the classroom and in peer-reviewed articles. Or you can try to have the hybrid that we do have in the United States today, but this is where that hybrid becomes really challenging to balance. I don't have a response to your question, and it's one that we're all grappling with. Those of us who love universities, those of us who love Israel, those of us who love Gaza and Palestine, you know, it's hugely challenging. But for the purposes of this discussion in this room today, what I would say is organizations, nonprofit organizations, vary widely in scale and scope. The kind of question you've posed about a university and the work that Justin does is at a particular scale and size. Kind of work I do, mostly, 
very small nonprofits, a lot of startups, a lot of grassroots organizations, a lot of community-based organizations who don't rise to the level of the question you asked. And so my only response is to remind you all, as those of us in the parenting business, now grandparenting business, will say, small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. So depending on the size of your nonprofit, what its mission is, what its reach is, what its pu public profile is, your governance needs and, um, and are, are going to be different. So yes, universities are right now in a, in a terrible bind trying to respond properly, if there is a proper response in this. And it does affect the governance. But what I would also say is that typically the boards of trustees on that level, as I saw with the Yale Corporation, are people um, who have huge um, experience professionally and are at a level of sophistication where, and have the resources, the legal and consultative and ethical you know, resources that they can tap to help them navigate these things. Smaller nonprofits who have more garden variety do-gooders you know, who become board members don't necessarily have the large scale problems, although there are plenty of problems in no, small nonprofits that have to be navigated that require legal and other kinds of uh, resources to help. There's always some employee problem. There's always something that happens. But, but it's a different, it, it, it's different in scale and scope. And, and I just want to say that because in this room, Today, I think that we have people who are going from those very high level, university level, museum level boards to uh, smaller grassroots nonprofits. And, and the problems aren't always exactly the same. And the resources to deal with those problems aren't always the same. And the board members are typically um, come from different walks of life and different levels of experience. So I would have a, a quick response, I guess, that's slightly different. And I really appreciate the analysis that both Justin and Marcy have brought to this. Obviously, I think a lot about ethics. I think I'm seeing this every day as, as this particular situation is playing out and across higher education, which I've also been involved with for many, many, many years. Um, I also, though, would step back and say that I think some of what is going on right now is going to rewrite several many books on how we think about relationships between donors and uh, large donors and institutions, and it's not just higher education. Um, it's been a long-standing issue in the field. It becomes also a power differential at times, mm -hmm. and in this day and age, to Justin's points, when People know, I mean, there was a time you could serve on a board that people didn't really know your innermost thoughts, your political leanings, mm. you know, all of the things, but now you do. <laughs> and it's out there, and in fact, there's often a call in situations, as we're seeing in real time right now, that you're actually affirmatively being asked to state opinions that in the old days, if you will, we're best kept kind of under wraps, and you might have it, you know, over the sherry after the board meeting, you know, have a few discreet discussions. And I think that is all now coming to a head that institutions rely so much on philanthropy in many ways. It's no longer just a tuition-driven environment for higher education, but that's true for museums and other large hospitals, other institutions as well and that there is this real timeness to understanding who are the people that you serve with and, and what are their private beliefs you know, as they staff these organizations. And honestly, if you knew all the private beliefs of all the people on your board and your organizations, it'd be even harder to recruit anybody. <laughs> so there's that. But then I think it also comes back to this conversation, which is governance, and, and especially in real time, 
you have to have a plan ahead of time, not only for the crisis-driven moment, but you have to have a plan about how you are going to approach encompassing and including whoever you need to include as a governance moment, especially when you are going to respond. Um, you speaking on behalf of an organization is a very dangerous thing. <laughs> and we encourage it all the time. We encourage it of the chair, we encourage it of the CEO, but boy can that go south if it's not done correctly. We're watching all of these things happening now. I don't know that we're gonna know the end story, if you will, to much of what is happening right now um, for a while. Think about how much has happened even in, within the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, this is obviously at scale, but these types of issues have been all along. It's just now the frequency and the inability to have time to be thoughtful and need and be demanded to have a response. This is where I think it's kind of coming to a head now on governance issues as well. Thank you, thank you all. I think we had, one, we had one question back here and then we'll come over here. So um, just a question about the legal structure of nonprofits. Um, I'm sure you're going to love this one. But so um, several, I served on several boards um, in the social justice field, right? So this is not your typical museum board. These are people who every day are looking at social justice issues and, and trying to create more equitable governing institutions. Um, and my conclusion is, not to put too fine a point on it, that like the 501c3 organization is like a wounded aging lion. Once noble, but like no longer can cut it. And, um, and part of that, I'll just give you one quick example, is I'm on a board of um, a legal services organization in the Bay Area, 100 lawyers, they're all social justice focused. And um, in some ways, if you talk with the staff, what they see is an ideal governance structure. It's the sociocracy. And I didn't even know what that was, but I do now. <laughs> um, and I just, is there a way um, that we can, so, so in some ways, the current board structure under a 501c3 organization is fundamentally at odds with the way that the actual doers of the organization, the people who are out there every day serving children and families, see governance. It's a hierarchical future of the structure. It was vetted in 1960. You know, it's old. So how do we reconcile those? Is there a way to change the legal structure so that those things aren't chronically at odds with each other? Well, I'll, <laughs> I'm I'll leaving that to the lawyers. You want to start or should I start? <laughs> I'm well, so glad I'm not All a I can tell you is I'm <laughs> currently developing the symposium for April 2024 called The Future of Nonprofit Regulation. This is what I do. So I, I, I want to go to that. I am <laughs> with you on the fact that we have so many obsolete structures. And if you look deeply, I encourage you to look deeply. It will help you go to sleep. Um, at, the IR, at the IRS code, you know, and all of the things that are in there, it really has been time for some time. And we have very, I spend most of my time when I'm not directing uh, a doctoral program, thinking about all the ways that we could incentivize both Congress and states to actually update what we do. And New York is very lucky. You've had a lot of intentionality in this state about updating your laws in the last years, but that's not true across the board. And I served on an IRS committee where it was announced that basically it will be an administrative uh, body as opposed to enforcement at that time. It's really moved in that space. So there's a lot of fear. Um, talk about governing by fear. There's a lot of fear of trying to touch ever what is considered kind of the third rail in, the, in this space. A lot of people, again, view that if you're already working in the nonprofit sector, why would you need a whole lot of regulation? It's the one part of Marcy's um, discussion that I do actively disagree with, which is that we are not actually a self-regulated body. Um, we are, in fact, regulated. It's just that we're regulated in ways, in my opinion, over years. Talk about obsolete. How about going back to the 1600s, which is where we actually came up with our system? Um, it is what I call a barnacled system. We haven't actually changed it. We just keep accreting. We just keep adding things here and there and all that. And so I hear you, and I think this may actually be as much as 69 or even when the tax code allowed, you know, in what, 13 for the exempt organizations piece of this, 
I think we are actually seeing an historical juncture here that is going to matter because our younger folks, not only through the social justice space, but also because so much more is peer-to-peer. -peer. Technology has changed so much of the way people think about their interactions that hierarchical structure can work for crisis communications and for making financial decisions and other things like that. It is not particularly serving well the way people view associational life um, to go back to talk about <laughs> it is not the way that people view it anymore. And so I think you are correct, and we will see what the next generation brings on this, because I can tell you my generation has done very little changing uh, in that space. I would, I would push back on, on, on the idea that about sort of the, 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 the problem of the hierarchy. And I, I'm not just trying to, I don't, it's not just because I have Stockholm Syndrome because I deal with this kind of structure all the time as a, in six minute increments. Um, <laughs> it, it's, I, I would say this, I, I think there is a lot of training that needs to be done and is happening in terms of overcoming things like inter, inherent bias or implicit bias, kind of the ways in which patriarchal structures, racial based structures are um, have led to results that are that are inequitable, and I think there's no question that that the structures that exist came out of different moments, and people use those structures for good and for ill. But I think one of the things about the structure of of the nonprofit space, and actually the corporate space more generally, is that it involves, to a certain extent, a denial of personhood by the members of the board. You know, when I go into a board meeting as a board member. My duty of loyalty means I put the organization before myself. That's the basic principle. That is a level of impartiality that's actually very hard to achieve. Um, and there's reason for that. And I think there's always this interesting question, you know, would the organization be better run if the board wasn't the donors, wasn't the outsiders, but in fact were the lawyers who are actually doing the work on the ground. And, and that's, a, that's a legitimate conversation to have and a really important one. But I think there's value for the organization and frankly for the people serving on that board in being forced into that position. And so I'm always a little bit uncomfortable to say, let's throw it out um, because the people who are doing the work should be the ones governing because it's actually very hard to be impartial about the work you're doing when you're in the trenches. So I guess that's how I'd respond to that. And I, I would just add to that, I, I, I agree with some of that, but I do think that there's a way, even without throwing everything out, that you can have accountability, which is the whole point of having a board, with less hierarchy. Well, thank you. Um, I think we have one final question. So um, I know we're running against the time, but one final question and then conclusion. But yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so this is actually a question about structure. Um, and just drawing on something um, that you brought up, Cindy, about how governance is not and shouldn't be just an afterthought, but that it's about the whole organization and everyone involved. I'm wondering what your thoughts are, and I have a feeling I'm asking that, that it's going to be sort of a one, there's no one size fits all kind of answer, but about how um, committee structure dovetails with governance, and um, do you see that ideally governance should be its own committee, or do you think it can be equally successful when it's governance and nominating in one, or ideally is there overlap between members of an executive committee and the governance committee? Do you, so that governance um, as like a practice, as an act of practice, doesn't get lost within the organization. And again, I know every organization is different, so it's a complex question. Uh, I can start, uh, since you, you asked. Um, I think there are ways when, some, when, a, when an organization is a baby organization um, when it's just starting, I think it's important that it's embedded somehow. It may not be a separate committee at the moment. Um, I'm a big fan of standing committees. I think that, and, and frankly, it's the equivalent of the task force. I'm, I'm a fan of sunsetting things that don't need to be forever. <laughs> um, again, I'm opposed to the accretion model of all things. Um, but I do think that governance needs to be embedded in different ways, and, and I mentioned this before. I think having it as a normalized part of your agenda for wherever you are in the life cycle of your organization, having it start at, as you're a baby organization, or if you're a legacy organization and it frankly hasn't been part of your conversation, having it on the agenda so that you can say, what are our governance challenges right now as part of the larger board meeting is great. 
Having something that explains, even to volunteers or staff, if you're large enough to have a handbook, for example, um, or other guidance that you have out there for, for staff or volunteers, having that be even you know, a section or a paragraph that says, all of us are responsible for good governance. You know, the see something, say something. You need a way that people can communicate up when they see problems. You'd be astounded how many volunteers actually see the problems that go on in an organization that a board is completely unaware of. And empowering them at an early stage when they first come in that it is normal to communicate issues within your organization. And also to replicate the good. That when things are happening that are going well, that's a good thing too. Not for a pat on the back, although that's lovely, but it's so that you can actually say, well, we are doing something that works. So that's another way to do it. I think you can have a governance committee, which I've always found, again, amorphous. Um, what does the governance committee do? They're usually also responsible for recruitment and all the things. Really think about it as almost a job posting. What is the skill set you're after? And then call it that thing. If it's a governance committee, then that committee ought to be raising issues around governance. Let them speak at the agenda, you know, on the agenda for the board meetings. Let them speak when you orient new volunteers and staff. But if it's a recruitment committee, great, call it that. <laughs> Don't confuse the issue. And I would say, maybe that's my last comment here even for today, is that governance shouldn't be that amorphous, to go back to my original comments. Everybody's got a perspective on it. Everybody thinks it's going to do something, the thing they think governance is going to do. Find a way within your organization, and we're working on it within our sector generally and how it works vis-a-vis -vis the corporate and even the govern government world. Find a shared language that you can at least agree on the basics in your organization of what governance means to you and your organization so that at least you have a way of communicating about it and then communicate about it. Thank, thank you, Cindy. I think, um, well, this leads us to the conclusion, I think. Um, you gave some concluding remarks, I I, um, but I want to give an opportunity for Justin and Marcy as well to give any concluding remarks. Well, uh, I would just say that, and, and you know, I'm not a lawyer, and I appreciate listening to, to Cindy and Justin, and it's really important to understand that all of this work in governance is so multidimensional, right? So I, I lean on the human interaction piece, the interpersonal side of it, because uh, that, for me, has been what I have observed the most difficult thing for people to do when they come on boards. There are frameworks. There are legal frameworks. There are regulatory frameworks. There are ethical frameworks people can hang on to. But they don't know how to do that together. And, um, and all, there is good intentionality, but to the point of having a governance committee where what I see is valuable in the governance committee is having that committee be the, the conscious holder of the education of the board, the ongoing education of the board, not just the, you know, one and done orientation, but continuing to um, raise the board's level of understanding and aspirational work, right, by bringing articles about governance. You need to know your organization's mission area knowledge, but you also need to know what this professional role you have as being a trustee or a director of a governing board is. You don't go to a doctor who hasn't been trained. You don't go to a lawyer who hasn't been trained, but you've handed over this entire organization to a bunch of people who have never been trained in what it means to govern. As amorphous as it may be, let's try to learn what, what the, the parameters are, of that are. And, um, and, and that's, that's what I push, um, and that's what I'm hopeful about in this work. Thank you. Justin? Um, when you have a crisis, just remember in the nonprofit space, you often have more time than you think. Um, it doesn't matter how many tweets happened on that day. Take the time, come up with a strategy, hire a lawyer, have your lawyer hire your PR counsel for privilege reasons. 
Um, but go back to mission in that moment and stop getting panicky about the fact that there's going to be a negative headline, because guess what? The fact that you're getting a negative headline actually means that people care about your organization, and that's probably worth something. And Cindy, your, your, no other words? No. Go, go <laughs> forth and govern. Go forth and govern. That's what I mean. so, Thank you. So I, um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to officially thank our panelists. You could tell why our conversations before were so interesting. And, um, and I hope that and our conversations with you were very interesting. So thank you as well thank you. for participating. Thank you. And I hope that you're, you still come and talk to all of us. So thank you all. Thank you, Astrid.